Hello uh, and welcome everyone to Bad Sydney uh, Crime Writers Festival 2021. How exciting it is for us to be able to do a festival in person for, for writers. It's a real buzz. Um, um, so there's also people watching on Zoom online, um, which is fantastic as well. And we've got dozens of people here in the room too, which is really exciting. Um, it's great to be back in a room, as I just said, um, and welcome to all those that are watching wherever you are. Um, I just wanted to start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, we acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Metcalf Auditorium today for this interview with Jack Beaumont. Fascinating guy who's written an absolutely cracking book called The Frenchman and we're going to have a lot of fun talking about it. Um, just a few short housekeeping announcements before we get underway. Um, as you already have seen, we're following COVID protocols. We're all double vaxxed. Um, we've all checked in with our QR codes and we should keep our masks on except when eating or drinking or in the case of speakers when you're for us on the stage um, and social distancing, you know, everyone's doing the right things here too as well. Um, please mute your mobile, mute, uh, sorry, your mobile phones and, and don't record the session. If you're taking photos, please turn off the flash. Feel free to um, share on social media at Bad Crime Sydney. Hashtag is Bad Crime Sydney too. We're going to have plenty of time for um, questions from you in the audience here, but also um, those on Zoom. And if you have them, just pop them in the um, in the chat um, in the chat area, and we'll get to them a little bit later. But Jack, let's start. I want to start with a question about the book. But it's also really a question about you. Much of the Frenchman is based on your former life as a spy for France's intelligence service, the GCSE. So the GSE. The GCSE, sorry. Um, um, your main char character is Alec Dupain. So who is he? Well, Alec is um, uh, the main character of the book, of course, and um, based on my own life. So he's married with two kids. Uh, and why uh, why the name uh, the pain is because um, the pain is the name of the first uh, grandmaster of the Templar Knights, uh, and uh, so the uh, <clears throat> the mentality of the Templar Knights uh, is fitting quite well with the mentality of uh, some spies, and um, they were basically the first spies, or well, not maybe not the first, but long long time spies. Um, and so um, I thought it was interesting to, uh, because my own personal life, I mean, my, my family is a very old French family. So you have all this background, you know, coming on your, on your shoulders uh, from your ancestors. And so I wanted the main character to have this same kind of, you know, weight on his shoulders from the past of his own family with France. Um, it's a gripping story. Um, tell us a little bit about the book, if you had to summarize do you ever want a bit of a teaser about the novel ah, just a teaser so um basically the the story uh so it's mainly based on on a, on a real story so on a, on a real mission so what i did is i did a, a mix um so there is one main mission which is of course i changed the countries etc but uh, and then i've been adding a few anecdotes on 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 this main mission uh, but basically um it's uh, mainly in Pakistan, and the idea is that the mission was to approach um, a center of research, uh, which was which is very confidential and which is working on bacteriological chemical weapon. Um, and so um, it's very hard to access it. And uh, basically, um, Alec has to approach a woman who is, you'll see in the book, somehow connected to the head of this uh, research center. So that at the end of the day, you can reach the information and the intelligence on what is happening inside this center. Um, your um, Jack Beaumont the, is, is a pen name, um, obviously, um, and, and for good reason. Um, how much, I guess, how much of the book is real? Well, you have two 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 sides uh, in, in in the book. I mean, the the, the family, the, the 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 family life of the main character in the book is is totally real. I mean, it's uh, clearly uh, myself. 
Um, and uh, now the story itself, as I was saying, it's, is based on a real mission. Um, and then, of course, I, I romanced it a bit because the idea, you have a lot of people, uh, not a lot, but some uh, ex-former spies who are leaving the services and they want to write a book and they want usually to write a book about what they really did, uh, like autobiography. Um, and of course, they have big troubles for that. Um, and so uh, the idea was not to, uh, to reveal any uh, high uh, state secrets. That's why I, I took the, uh, the option to make a, a fiction and novel. Uh, but what I really wanted to address is that actually 90% of us are married with kids. And so you have to, uh, you have to do this kind of uh, things which are usually illegal and uh, in the total darkness. And then you have to come back home and you have your kids jumping at you and going, ah, daddy, you know, and, 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 and you have to remember who you are uh, because you have five different IDs uh, all, all the time. And, and, and a few hours before you were doing something quite dangerous and, and mean to someone. And then after you have to uh, come back home and give the bath to your kids. Yeah. So. so you wanted to give everyone, I guess the reader then a, a real, a real insight into what it is to be, um, to be in that line of work. And, and there's been can, some comparisons already um, with John Le Carre and, and, and I can really see that in reading your book. Um, is, was that the most important thing for you? Because you, you wanted, um, you know, Alec Depayne to be a, a real person? Yeah, well, maybe I should explain uh, why originally I decided to write a book. Mm -hmm. is, is, um, so I was having those uh, nights where I was waking up at night in the middle after leaving the services. Uh, I was waking up at night at 2 a.m., checking every door, checking every window of the house with a knife in my hand and sitting on, on the couch in the living room in the dark, looking at the door, waiting, expecting someone to come in, you know. Um, and I was having the PTSD, you know, uh, syndrome. And so I had a discussion with a, a friend of mine here in, in Sydney uh, over a few beers. And, uh, and he said to me, look, you should you should write a book, you know, you should write it down and as a cathartic process, basically. And so uh, that's, that's how I decided and started to write the book. And, and this mission in particular, especially the beginning of the book, which is also based on a true story, um, was uh, something which was still in my mind. And I was st still having nightmares about, about what happened to this kid and, 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 and to the, the wife. Um, so I, I decided to... Uh, to write it down as a cathartic process, basically. And I mean, how was that? Was that cathartic for you? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah a lot. I mean, the, the, even the simple fact that I'm sitting here in front of you, uh, chatting about it, uh, it's something that I would, I would never have done uh, a few years ago. So how does a guy, how many, how many years were you in intelligence? So I, I was in the intelligence. So when you are in the intelligence, you have people, uh, when you join the secret service, you have, as an officer in the, in the military, usually you go um, as an analyst mm -hmm. on a certain topic. And after a few years of an, uh, as an analyst, you uh, switch to uh, uh, the human, uh, what we call the UMINT, so the uh, approach of sources or human sources, et cetera. Uh, but you're always protected with a diplomatic passport uh, and this kind of stuff. And, and then you have the, the bad guys who are the operational division uh, who are on the field and do clandestine operations with no backup uh, whatsoever and no diplomatic passports uh, to do the illegal stuff, clandestine operations. And so that's where I was. Mm. Um, and so I did eight years. Uh, normally, it's five years maximum on the field as an operative. And I did eight. Um, is that because of burnout? That's five. Uh, the average is five. <clears throat> no, burnout, divorce. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of divorce, um, and because uh, after a moment, it's not really burnout. It's the, the, the it's not like a burnout in a normal job. It's the psychological aspect of it, where you have to. So you are recruited because. Uh, you have a, a kind of morality and uh, intellectual honesty because you're going to have to do some stuff on the other side of the world. Uh, and if you uh, don't do it well, the French president will have to say sorry. Uh, so um, so you have, they have to trust you. So they recruit you for this uh, psychological aspect and, and the light, your, your light part of your soul. But in the same time, they ask you to develop 
as much as you can your dark side so that you can fight the, the, the bad guys. And you realize after usually five years that the dark side has become uh, predominant. Mm. And, 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 and so you have, to, you have to stop because you're losing yourself. You don't even recognize yourself. Uh, and sometimes even with your kids or your wife. So I, I did eight years and I roughly did more than a hundred mission. Wow. Um, I want to talk a lot more about this stuff, but I thought let's wind back the clock a bit because, you know, this hasn't been your whole life. Um, before joining the intelligence services, you're a, a, a fighter pilot yeah. in the French Air Force. Tell us a little bit about that. I, I joined, so I, um, I did my, um, I finished my studies quite, uh, quite young and I did um, mathematics and physics engineering uh, one year earlier than normal. Then I joined the Air Force at 18 and I did my first war mission uh, as a fighter pilot at 21, uh, which was in Bosnia. Um, and then I did, uh, so I was flying a sing single seaters for dogfight jets. So it's called Mirage 2000. Um, and I did uh, so Bosnia, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan. And, and then I had a, a flying accident. I, I, I basically crashed yeah, the, with, with the jet. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. Because, I mean, it's a very painful memory, I should yeah. say. <laughs> but, um, but it was fascinating what happened. Was it a, it was a training exercise, wasn't it? <clears throat> yeah, it was in training. So the, the, uh, all the, the, the operational mission I did uh, was lucky enough to uh, not to have any, any problem. And this one was a training. And um, I don't know if you know what is the G-force you take, so the acceleration you have in the plane. And when you fly this kind of, of jet, each turn you do, uh, you take nine Gs in, in, a, in a dogfight. So it's nine times your weight. Uh, and if you pull the stick a bit more, which is uh, like 42 kilos pressure on, on the stick, you can go up to 12 Gs, which is uh, enormous. Uh, knowing that fully equipped, I was almost 100 kilos. Uh, so you can imagine the weight it puts on, on the back, on the lower back, etc. Et and uh, it was during a dogfight and I was totally twisted in my seat, looking behind on the other guy coming on me. Uh, and uh, to counter him, I've been pulling a lot of Gs, but instead of putting myself uh, back straight in the seat, I stayed uh, twisted. And so the pressure on my spine plus the torsion uh, have been expulsing three discs on the lower back on the left side, uh, which, were, we, which popped out on the left side. So I was paralyzed of the left leg in the pain with a um, quite intense uh, pain. Um, and uh, the ejection seat is 25 instant Gs. Uh, so uh, knowing that you have a problem in your back, yeah. you don't want to try yeah. the addiction because it would have been being in a chair for the rest of my life. So the weather was nice. Um, there had no wind, so I, I took the decision to try to land the plane. But the problem is that when you uh, land the plane, the, the direction of the front wheel is with the legs and the braking is on the top of the feet and my left leg was not working. Uh, so I had a, a brilliant idea on the paper, <laughs> which was just on the paper. And so my idea was that I would leave my right, right leg uh, smooth so that I can press on my knees with my hands to try to control uh, yep. uh, the, the, the front wheel. And of course, it didn't work. So the, only my right leg broke um, and, and, uh, and the plane went on the right side of the runway. So I've been hitting the grass. The landing gear went in. Uh, and then the plane went uh, on a, as a fireball on the right side of the runway for a few hundred meters. But I don't remember anything. I mean, my head, uh, I al already had a very small brain before, but <laughs> <laughs> so the, my, my head has been hitting the canopy and I was knocked out. And so uh, it took the fireman a bit more than two hours to take me out of the canopy, to cut the plane, basically, to take me out. And I woke up at the hospital after the surgery. And um, I guess the... The difficult question then is, what's a plane like that worth? Uh, 80 million euros. Eight. 80. 80, 80, zero. 80 yeah. zero million euros. Well, they, um, they must have really loved you in the Air Force. But, yeah, but, well. But you made it out. Um, and um, the recovery. Back on jets after. Yeah. 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 So the recovery process. Um, let's talk a little bit about that because then it does lead us into the next job and then the one after that. So. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about what, what you did next, but also the recovery. I mean, a hell of an injury. Yes. Um, I remember after the first surgery, the, um, the, the professor 
who uh, uh, who uh, did the, the surgery came to see me in the room and you know, said the first question I asked him is when when will I be able to fly again? And I said, oh, I think my young friend, you don't understand. Uh, for you, the flying is over. And I said, well, I don't think so. So three months after, uh, I was back in the jet. Um, but I had to sign. So the, the, I knew that um, an ejection would have smashed my back. Uh, so basically, I was flying in a jet knowing that I couldn't eject anymore. I would have been paralyzed. So I had to sign the discharge because it's very expensive to train a fighter pilot. So when you tell the military doctors that you're happy to continue to fly <laughs> at your own risks, they go like, oh, okay, great. Yeah. So you, you, sign, you sign the paper. And so, uh, so I went back on, on jets and then, uh, I mean, taking nine Gs every day, uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't cope with it. So I was taking painkillers in the morning, painkillers before the flight, painkillers after the flight, painkillers at night. And so at some point I, I've been, you know, putting the hand up and say, look, I, I just can't. And my squadron uh, commander said, look, you're going to kill yourself or worse, you're going to kill someone else. So uh, you, you have to stop and say, okay, I accept to stop, but only if, uh, if you retrain me as a, a pilot, military uh, transport pilot, because when you've been driving the Formula One, you don't want to drive a truck. Uh, so I was like, uh, yeah, I accept to be retrained in something, but only if this something is sexy and rock and roll. And, and, uh, and uh, they came back to me saying, look, uh, there is a, an open position in uh, special forces, if you want, uh, to fly uh, for special forces. And I'm like, I was like, well, looks interesting. So they said the purpose uh, mainly will be to go in the Balkans and to do the, the hunt of the Serbian war criminals. And so with illegal landings uh, on roads, on fields, by night, all the lights off, dropping some guys, picking up some guys. And that's, that's what I did after for, for, for two years. And you met some pretty interesting people, I'd imagine, doing that as well. Yeah, well, I had some good, uh, good stories. In, uh, yeah, some, uh, yeah, well, so the people I was having any at the back. Yeah. Huh? Any, any stories you could tell? Uh, well, there is one, actually, which is in, 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 in the book. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, landing, I don't know, in, in, uh, in Tirana, in Albany, in Albania, where you have the guys, uh, you know, knocking at the, the screen of the plane with a Kalashnikov to, to come in uh, or trying to take off. And you have, like you see in movies, the pickups on each side of the runway, you know, shooting at you with a, with a Kalash and you try to take off before hitting the guy who is at the, the end of the runway. Um, so this was, this was good fun. I mean, I was flying really, really low, you know, with night vision goggles. Uh, when I say low, it's like... Uh, between 10 and 30 feet uh, high, uh, so low, uh, lower than uh, like the ceiling. You know? Wow. Yeah. So no one can see you coming or yeah. whatever. Um, so that was, yeah, that was great. And, and then I had a survival training in the Alps, uh, in the mountains to uh, basically go and do the same in Afghanistan for Ben Laden at that time. Uh, and uh, so you have to survive for five days by yourself, you know, in the snow and everything. So. I was digging my igloo. Excuse, you have to uh, go under the snow. Um, and actually, snow is very heavy on the spade. And I did this stupid movement of twisting with my spade. And one of the discs popped out again. Uh, but I was by myself in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so I had to walk uh, for, uh, 10, 12 hours with a severe pain to walk down and find someone. Um, so I had a second surgery. And then the military doctor said, look, uh, sorry, but that's, that's the rule. Two surgery on the back, you lose your medical ability to fly in the military. Mm. So they said, you can keep your commercial medical ability to fly as a commercial pilot. But for the military, you don't. And same, I didn't want to go and drive a bus. Uh, so uh, I said, uh, uh, OK, thank you very much. Uh, so I was a bit lost. And actually, those guys I was transporting in the Balkans were all special forces, all DGSE, so Secret Service. And I, I didn't know at the beginning. I just realized it after a certain amount of weeks and months. And, uh, and so some of them became uh, mates. And so um, not knowing what I was going to do, one of them, uh, I had a lunch with one of them in Paris. And he said, why don't you try to, um, to join the DGSE? I said, well, yeah, it looks fun. So... 
I did the test, which is one year test. Uh, not to lose, uh, not to lose the, the, this one year, I went back to some studies uh, and did an MBA in uh, business intelligence. Uh, so that if I was not selected, at least I had, you know, didn't lose my, my time. Uh, and then I, I was selected as an analyst. So normally you go as an analyst and, and you have the basic training, which is a few months. And uh, the, 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 the field part of this basic training, actually the operation division has an eye on it. And sometimes they do some cherry picking. And of course you don't know about it. So I finished the training, went as an analyst for maybe a, a month. And then I had a phone call uh, of a guy saying, I'm, I'm the recruiter for the operational division. Can you come and see me? So I'm sure. I said, do you want to do the test to join the uh, operational division? Sure. So I took some holidays <laughs> because you have to do it on your holidays uh, because your management of the intelligence division mustn't know that you apply for the operational division. And uh, I came back after a week with a big black eye. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a heavy test. And, and, um, and then uh, I, I was selected and I joined the operational division and, yeah, and then I, I did eight years. Um, your wife is Australian. Yes, yeah, she is. And um, obviously, one of the reasons why you're here um, was, so if we can talk a little bit about her, where, where did you meet? We met in the uh, southwest of France, so in the Basque country. Uh, she, was, um, she was having dinner with her boyfriend. Um, <laughs> Please don't the, tell yeah, me you heard him. <laughs> at, the, at the table next, to, um, next to, to mine, and I was having dinner with um, another fighter pilot. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's how we met. So I, I met her on that night because I was doing the, um, as a fighter pilot, I was doing, you know, the flight demonstration um, uh, for, for air shows, etc. And, and uh, so I was coming back from an air show in UK. And uh, when you finish air shows, all the pilots love to exchange stuff, you know, like I give you my flight suit and you give me a patch, you give me this, you know. And I was telling my, my friend that um, a Royal Air Force pilot offered me an Australian hat. And I heard this little voice next to me saying, oh, you're talking about Australia, I'm Australian. And that's how it started. And I, I asked her to marry me three months after. Wow, what a great. So she's been there for this journey with you really through the, the military and into intelligence. So how old were you when you met? Uh, 27, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. So I, I met her uh, just before finishing the jets. Um, and then when I was in special forces, uh, she was there and I was, uh, going away, um, for a few days, uh, leaving uh, the flat in the, in the middle of the night. Um, and, uh, and then the intelligence. And so, but I didn't tell her that I applied for the intelligence originally, because uh, if I was not selected, there was no point, you know, so, and, uh, on that day we were in uh, IKEA. <laughs> in ikea next to next to paris and i was um, on the top of the ladder trying to grab the uh, groove du caput, you know the whatever and uh and uh and i had my phone ringing and it was a general of the air force saying uh, you're gonna have a phone call in one minute uh, with unknown caller you should take it oh, okay so i was still on the top of the on the scale <laughs> i took the phone i had this guy saying uh, you uh, yes i am uh, we are expecting you on the on that day at this address uh, you've been selected uh, don't be late, Kunk. And uh, so I walked down the scale and looked at my wife. And she said, what, what, what? I said, well, actually, I didn't tell you something, but uh, uh, I'm going to become a spy. <laughs> and so, After the military and the yeah. accidents, I'm sure she went, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I guess the eight, nine years, eight and a half years or something you spent. Eight, eight years in eight the services. Years, yeah. yeah. Um, having almost a, a double life, what was that like? And if I can, you know, ask probably more personal question around, you know, juggling your family through that time. And you've spoken a little bit about that already. Um, how much does your wife get to know? So it's a, it's a, it's a good question that um, because she's Australian, when I joined the company, the company asked me not to tell her anything. I, how can you disappear for a month uh, 
and not you know can't re don't reply to your phone and nothing just disappear without telling your wife why you know a recipe for for divorce and so um, so I, I decided to tell her and I told her I was in the DGSE uh, but that I couldn't tell her what I would do exactly and she said look um, actually I don't want to know so I I I know where you're working uh, I know that's what you want to do but I don't want to know what you are doing exactly. I, I don't want to know more than that because it's too dark for me. And I don't want to take this darkness into my life. Um, like if you, I guess, then put yourself in her shoes, then what, what do you think um, she saw in you over those eight years? Was this what sort of, I mean, it must have been very difficult in a relationship and it's, it's fantastic that you've got such a wonderful family and had that support. And, and, and you'd said there's a lot of, you know, divorce in, in this sort of game. Um, game's not really the right word for it. It's an incredibly serious job, but um, so, so, you know, from, from, I guess from her, what do you think she, you know, felt at that time and, and would she help with the decision in the end to, to come out and, and, and leave? I think she felt uh very lonely uh, because uh, when you are in the intelligence especially as an operative you uh, you lose all your friends uh, most of your friends uh, because you can't tell anyone uh, and so uh, you try to limit the social interaction so that you don't have to lie or you don't have to not tell um, so you lose all your friends uh, you have to declare to the company uh, maybe three real friends you're going to continue to see and they have to be checked. Um, and so you, you, it did happen to some friends that, you know, the company says, you, don't have, you mustn't see this guy anymore or this, this person anymore. Of course, you're lying to your family. So I asked her to lie to her parents, of course, who didn't know. Um, so your, your social uh, life totally, uh, you know, disappears. Uh, and your husband disappears uh, as well. And you don't know when he's going to come back. You don't know where he is. You can't contact him because that would be the biggest mistake to do. Um, because the real risk, the reason why we have false identities, uh, it's, it's not uh, James Bond or Jason Bourne. The, the, real, the reason why we have false identities is to protect the family. Because if um, the bad guys... Uh, you are dealing with uh, discover that your spy and your real name uh, n really not good for the family. So, uh, so you have those false identities to protect uh, your your real life. And so, for her, uh, it was um, I guess having someone coming back home always unexpected, um, who was still in his mind someone else uh, carrying. Uh, some heavy things in his mind because it was very dark. And as a wife, you don't know what he really did. You can only imagine. Um, and, and of course, of course, because you're a spy, you have another ID, another bank account, another address, another this and another that, and you're in another country. Uh, of course, she thinks that you may have some, you know, mistresses, affairs, and of course, uh, logic. Um, and, and a lot, actually, a lot of spies uh, do, uh, of course, um, because they reach a point where they can't communicate with their wife anymore. Uh, they don't understand each other anymore. That's why they, they divorce. Um, and, uh, and so she was, um, yeah, very lonely. Uh, she deserves much more, much more medals than I do. Uh, so uh, very lonely because couldn't tell anyone, losing all her friends by herself with the kids. Uh, not knowing where your husband is um, and uh, each time she was when I was coming back uh, sometimes she was telling me oh, I met this um, this mom at school you know she's very nice we have the kids in the same in the same in the same class etc and um, I was telling her you know how did she approach you have you seen her before and what did she ask have you seen her car have you seen her ID plate have you seen the husband uh, how for how long the kid was in that school? Did you been have you been to her place? Did she come to our place? Where were you meeting? Uh, you know, mm. and I mean, I, I should say you've captured that very well in the book. And when you talk about you know um, Alec de Payne being sort of ninety percent you, um, that cathartic process you spoke about earlier. I mean, the story you're telling there around how people 
become friends with with your wife or children um that's 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 all in the book and that's one of the thing i love things i love about the book is that that sense of authenticity and i really you know get to know um i guess and get to feel the kind of life you had to lead which i think you know is incredibly um you know trying on you and your family too what about being a father um and living in this life your kids were pretty small during that time um did you ever get questions from them and things? Yeah, I had, um, I had questions. For, the more they were growing, the more they were asking questions, for sure. And especially when I, I have a, a good uh, anecdote, if you want. I, I came back once from a mission, and on, for that mission, I was um, a war reporter, so uh, press, you know, media. So I had long hair, beard, and I was dressed like a war reporter, okay? <laughs> and and, um, and uh, I came back, and... Um, and uh, my wife said, ah, oh, you know, there is this teacher at school. She really wants to see you because there is a, there is a big problem with, a, with our, older, our older son. I said, oh, okay. Uh, so I went to school so with my beard, my long hair, with everything. And I saw the teacher. I said, so what's the, what's the problem? And she said, well, your son is lying. I said, what do you mean lying? Well, he's telling everyone that his dad is a fighter pilot. And I was like, you know, with a beard, with long hair. <laughs> So I looked at her and I said, well, I'm a fighter pilot. And she went like, oh, okay. So the, maybe the dad is lying as well. And at the end of the year, uh, I went to pick him up at school, short hair, shaved, in uniform. Ah, well done. <laughs> and so she was like, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it, it's, it's um, the more they were growing. So before the book came out, they didn't know. So for them, I was special forces. They knew a little bit about that and fighter pilot. And, uh, and, and that's it. But it's it's um, really hard uh, to have to lie to your own kids, you know. Uh, and and what is really hard is that to reach the intelligence you need to grab. Sometimes you need to threat some people, and the way you threat them sometimes is through the family and through the kids, because that's the only way. And uh, so you do uh, silly uh, bad bad stuff to some people. The rule is basically when you enter someone's life, grab the intelligence which is in his mind, he or her mind, it will never, never end up well for this person and for this family. Because from the moment you will manage to grab the intelligence you want, which is in this mind, you want no, no one else to have the same intelligence and you want no one else to know that you grabbed it. So this person mustn't be able to deliver this intelligence about you or about how you approached this person or about what this person gave to you. So basically this person must disappear. There, there is an acronym, isn't there? Is it MICE? Yeah, the MICE. Yeah, yeah you tell us a little bit about that. It's, uh, the MICE is the four leverages to, um, to manipulate someone. So the way it works basically is um, you will start to, uh, first you have to uh, determine the target, the, the person of interest you're gonna, you're gonna approach because of where he works or she works or uh, for a lot of different reasons. And then uh, you're going to do what we call the operational environment and the technical environment. So you're going to be a ghost around this person and you're going to uh, follow this person, observe this person, wife, kids, mistresses, anything. You will know everything about this person without this person realizing that you are, you are around him. And then the technical one about phone, emails, etc. Et so you reach a point where you, yeah, you, you really know everything about this person. And then you will consider the mice. So it's the four leverages to, manip to manipulate someone, which is M for money, I for ideology, C for coercion, and E for ego. And so everyone can be manipulated on one of those uh, leverages. Um, and Thanks to those two environments, operational and technical, you will define the mice. And then the next step is to enter the person's life with the phase of approach, where you're going to define if the mice which has been detected before is the good one or not. And then you're going to start the manipulation to bring this person on the, the leverage you, you detected. Uh, and then you have the phase of recruitment where you stop the approach and you basically tell the guy or the woman, what I want to know is this. And if it's well done, the person doesn't have the choice to say no. 
uh, and then you have the manipulation. Uh, that's that's basically how it works. And when there is no mice, it did it did happen to me a few times where uh, the guy is a, a good father, a good husband. Uh, he's got enough money. He's got no specific ideology. Um, he's not no specific ego. You're gonna create the mice. So you're gonna totally uh, destabilize his life um, by lots of different ways so that you can create the mice and create the leverage. Um, that's pretty fascinating and hard, I guess, on you as well. I mean, to be able to do that, it's always around a mission. So something that the French government isn't in their national interest, I guess. Was there, you've spoken about this a little bit already, but I just want to get a sense. Was there a single event or was it an accumulation of things where you went, okay, enough's enough. I'm, I'm out. Yeah. One, one, one day I came back from, um, from a mission where I had to do some very specific things. Um, and, uh, and I was really, it's like uh, being an actor, you know, you're in your character. And I was for my self-preservation and not to be caught and die or tortured because if you get caught, you have a, a bad few minutes. Um, so I was really into my character and, and I came back home and uh, I looked at myself uh, in the mirror of the, of the bathroom. And I, I thought, looking at myself, I thought, you, you, you're the devil. You know? You're the devil. You're a monster. And so I, I could see in my eyes the... the the, 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 how, you know, not dangerous, but how mean or, you know, dangerous in a way I, I had become, uh, how dark I had become. And then I thought, uh, it's, you know, it's when you can't recognize yourself, you just like, well, maybe I should stop. Yeah. So then, Australia, Byron Bay. <laughs> so you came out to Australia with your family. Um, this was going to be your, you know, new life. Um, you've been coming out already because, you know, your wife's Australian, but um, talk us about a time in, tell everyone a little bit about a time in Byron Bay. I think it was the first time you met your mother-in-law. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, so my wife comes from Byron Bay and my parents-in-law arrived in Byron Bay in 71. So they are original Byron Bay hippies. And uh, of course, with my background, uh, it's not exactly the same Thing. and uh and so uh i arrived um in baron bay for the first time i already asked her to marry me so i mean i was coming to meet my future in-laws and um and so we arrived late at night and the first morning so i didn't know my my parents-in-law and and the first morning i was waking up waken up by my mother-in-law who, uh, so I was in the bed and she naked, of course. And so she shook, she shook me <laughs> and I was like, oh, what's happening? And, and she said, ah, oh, you have to come with me. I'm going to the, uh, the peace march of Bangalore, you know, the peace walk of Bangalore with all flowers and you know, the flags and everything. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, come with me. So that way I get to meet you, to know you. It's, oh, you have to come with me. That's what we do here. Okay. So I, but the, the, my suitcase was still unpacked. So I just opened the suitcase and, and grabbed the first T-shirt, which was at the surface of my suitcase. And uh, the T-shirt was um, in the back. It was written uh, Iraqi Freedom. It was a T-shirt with a, with a Mirage 2000 and written Iraqi Freedom with a mission in Iraq. I just did. So I arrived at the Peace Walk of Bangalore, <laughs> short hair with the T-shirt Iraqi Freedom. And, and uh, well, I, I haven't been reinvited since to the, the, the Peace Walk of Bangalore. Um, yeah, pro protests with hippies are now off the... Uh... Well, actually, a lot of them were coming to see me and were like, yeah, yeah, sh thinking that I was showing how against, you know, the war I was. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, look, it's a good time to um, ask people watching online, if you've got any questions, pop them in the, um, in the chat area and we'll try to get to some of those. And also for those in the audience, if you've got a question um, now, just um, stick up your hand and we'll get a microphone to you and, um, and bring you in on the conversation. I'm sure there's plenty. Um, while you're having to think about your questions, actually, there's a bit that I wanted to just to read. Um, actually, I can drink my water while yeah. you read. Okay. I, I'm going to get you to read it here. Me? I'm going to, yeah, you want to read it? Uh, I can read it for you. Yeah. Okay. You can okay. Read it while I'll, I'm drinking. Yeah. You have a drink. I'll read it. So I just wanted to read this little bit because we've talked a lot about your life as a spy your father, the fact that you're a father, 
with children and a husband, a family man, and how important that is for you. There's this beautiful little exchange that I think talks to what um, it would have been like, you know, as a, as, a, as a spy with young children. So here we go. They peeled out in Romy's VW Polo and turned west as Patrick fiddled with the music player. Dad, what's a spy? Asked Oliver. The whole family's in the car, by the way. If you didn't. Um, why are you asking? Because my friend wants to play spies at school, but I don't know what it is, said Oliver, rearranging his sock around the shin guard. Well, let me think, said Depayne, breaking for a red light. A spy is a person who finds out things for his or her country, things they're not supposed to know. A spy secret? Yes, son, Depayne said with a chuckle. You may know one, but you wouldn't know they're a spy. Oliver considered the answer and Patrick piped up. Play the moon song, dad, he said. The pain searched Spotify and they sung Bad Moon Rising, even as his ribs ached. He was happy, as close to balancing his life as he could ever hope for. And from what everything we've talked about now, that, that bit, it really touched me reading it. It's right near the end of the book, but that journey that you've come on, how do you, how do you feel about that journey now and, and, and looking back on it? Oh, look, the, I could um, resume this. But, uh, after the book came out, so I had to tell my kids. So I, 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 I said to my wife, I said, uh, you know, I have to tell them now because the book is going to come out. And uh, she said, okay, but don't make a big deal out of it. <laughs> and don't pretend you're James Bond. I said, well, I won't pretend James Bond. And, um, and so, um, so I grabbed them one morning and I said, no, look, uh, you always wanted to know what I was doing, and uh, I'm gonna tell you. So they were like, "Really, really?" I was like, "Yeah." I so, uh, used to be a spy, and so there was a big bang. They looked at each other and they start laughing, uh, like if I was teasing them. And I said, "Well, I'm serious." And so the elder one did say nothing, and the second one, the younger one, started to cry. And I went like, "Why are you crying?" And so, "Well, because now some bad people are gonna come after you and after us." And I said, well, no, that's, that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works. It, it, shouldn't, uh, it shouldn't happen. Yeah. A life in the shadows can stay in the shadows in, in a way. Oh, yeah, but because the way it's done, the people I've been working on or against, um, uh, unfortunately, are all, de all dead. Or uh, because they, are, uh, they gave those secrets away, they have absolutely no interest for anyone to know that they've been knowing me uh, or they are still giving secrets and they have no interest for anyone to know that they are still giving secrets. So normally uh, it shouldn't happen. And what about you? So looking around a, a crowded restaurant or in a pub or, you know, the room like this with people in an audience, do you, does your mind retreat back to the kind of profiling stuff that you would have done? Yeah, 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 and all all the time. I mean, even now, driving, I'm always checking, always checking uh, if I'm followed or not. Um, when I go to a hotel room, I always put different things. And there is way of doing it in the hotel room to make sure that when I get out, the room is not checked. And uh, and yes, of course, uh, I, I'm I'm checking uh, I'm checking who is entering the the room and and different profiles of of, of people. Um, for sure, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's automatic. Um, life after um, your time with the DGSC, um, you've, you've still, you know, you've, you've, you, you, what sort of work have you been doing? What can you tell us about that? It's, it's a while that you've been out now and um, before yeah, you so left. I left uh, in 2014 and, um, and since then I've been working in uh, defense. Aerospace and defense. Um, and life in Australia. Um, you surf, but you surfed in France as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I started surfing when I was a, a young kid in the Basque Country. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I surf as much as I can here in Australia. Yeah. And as, as a Frenchman living in Australia, who's pretty across what's been going on in the world the last few decades, um, I'm interested in your, in your thoughts around... Um, uh, I guess the state of the world at the moment, we've got, you know, the big disruptors in social media and information um, 
far right nationalism, you know, taking a foothold in many countries. What, what's your take on where, where Australia is at the moment? It'll maybe start with, a, I, I guess, a, some thoughts around, I guess, global politics um, first up. In, in, and then and then maybe Australia. You know, spies are not politicians. They nah. are, uh, we are executors. We uh, obey to orders and we do missions and we're not trying to uh, too much to understand uh, or to think of, you know, why we've been asked uh, this and that. Um, sometimes we have to work against uh, bad, bad people. And it's, it makes it easier uh, for us psychologically. And sometimes we have to work on good people. Mm. Uh, and it's very hard because that's where you know that you're going to smash the, the, the life of a good person, but for superior interests. But for the world globally, I think it's uh, very, very unstable at the moment. Um, there is in, in, in Europe is very uh, weak at the moment. Um, between France and, Ger and Germany, it's not the big love anymore um, the, the the gas uh, battle on the mediterranean sea uh, with the russians and with Nord Stream 2 and uh, israel uh, libya turkey uh, cyprus i mean there is a lot there uh, of course what's happening and what just happened in afghanistan um, the, the the fact that now india is is stuck on the, on the top with china and pakistan uh, it's it's quite uh, dangerous um, what China is doing, I mean, it's a, it's a, dict a dict dictator, uh, communist, uh, not respecting the rights, human rights, uh, sending people to camps on the north, and everyone is, you know, doing business with them. Um, they, they want to expand, and they will expand. I don't know when they're going to jump on Taiwan, but I guess it's going to happen quite shortly. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Russia jumps in, on Ukraine in the same time, not long after. Um, so Australia in the middle of all this, I mean, of course, the future, the submarine, French submarine and the AUKUS alliance, et cetera, et cetera. I wasn't going to mention the submarines. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I think that uh, uh, you mustn't put all your eggs in the same basket. It's quite dangerous. Is, is I guess, a, a simplifier question on that. Now, do you think the world is a safer or more dangerous place than when... You were working in the military. From my point of view, it was never safe. Uh, so uh, I couldn't tell if it's more or less. Uh, I've been, uh, on my 20 years of military service, I was, uh, if you consider all the missions for the intelligence for the DGC, I was basically on a, I did roughly eight years of war mission. So, uh, I mean, uh, while people were living in France without even realizing that there was a war going on. You know, that's the thing with the intelligence as well. It's like, you know, the movie Matrix. You, you have this feeling where you are in a city, you can be a Prague or, you know, this kind of city, and you're actually working on dangerous matters, and you have people around being tourists and living their life normally. And you really feel like in Matrix, you are the people who know and the people who don't know. And you see, you see what is under, and those people don't don't realize what is on and and good on them, you know. It's better. Uh, and sometimes you think, oh, you know, why, why am I here? Why why I I did that choice? Because it's like when you never did any scuba diving, and you look at the ocean, all you see is the horizon and the boats. And from the moment you did once scuba diving, you can't look at the ocean without thinking what is under. It's the same in the intelligence. Fascinating way to think about it. Um, are there any questions that others? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, if, if uh, okay, great. Thank you. I'll I'll get to some of those. And and so you had a question. I can repeat it for everyone online. Do you wanna? Sure. Um, so the the question is um for a surfer slash a spy <laughs> slash fighter pilot. How did you learn how to write? Well, I always um always liked. Uh, to write and of course uh, even when you're a spy uh, there is a massive part of the work which is done on the field but there is also a big part of the work which is done behind a computer typing uh, everything in the very detailed way you just uh, did because if someone has to take the file after uh, or if you get killed or whatever you know it has to be so much detailed on the person you met where you met her, 
why, et cetera, et cetera, that you have to write actually a lot. And, and the way you write it down when you meet someone like a source, a human source you manipulate, the way you write it down when you come back is, is like almost writing a novel because you, you write the, the full story. And, and, um, and I always uh, liked uh, doing this. Um, and so, and then I was lucky enough to have a, to have a, a very good uh, editor uh, who uh, helped me to uh, get rid of my crappy English and put things in the right form. Um, I've got a question here from Diana online. Thanks, Diana. Um, the book was a cracking read with a brilliant end. I'm giving it to my brother. I'm giving my brother a copy for Christmas. That's good. One sale. Um, what are you writing next? Well, I'm working on number two at the moment. Uh, uh, with the same characters, uh, different mission, different part of the world. Um, and here's one from Karen. I'll go straight to another one. Um, due to the nature of your former life, has it been necessary to alter your physical appearance so that you can't be recognized? Yeah, sometimes you have, as I was saying, you know, you have to um, have a, a long beard or long hairs or this kind of stuff. But People always think that, uh, oh, you're going to be recognized. I mean, the people, all of you, you've been, let's say, working with four years ago or meet, uh, meeting once or twice in a cafe or in a restaurant uh, for whatever, you, you are capable of recognizing them in the street? No. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. And the question is, did your wife or does your wife speak French or did you communicate in English? Yeah, so um, she's uh, fluent in French. And uh, when I met her, she still had this very strong English accent, Australian accent. And now, because of me, uh, she's speaking like a military man. <laughs> um, it's great news for everyone that you're writing another book. Um, but there's also some news on the, the film front as well. Yeah, I, I sold the um, the rights to uh, actually so to Hollywood. They make they want to make a TV series out of it, and um, and the funny thing is that uh, the, the the people who bought the rights are the sons of John Le Carré. Yeah. Nice touch. Um, question from the audience again. Question from Lorraine Peck who has a vivid imagination. She's a crime writer as well. <laughs> Her book, The Second Son, well worth a read. The question is, in your job um, as a spy in recruiting people, did you have to try to get someone to fall in love with you? So you haven't read the book, have you? Okay. So, okay, so you will have the reply in, in, your, in the book. <laughs> <laughs> nice touch, nice touch. Um, Probably not a question we can answer. It's, it's, it's not, um, I mean, you can have some actions in your life uh, where indirectly driving your car, for example, and you can provoke an accident and you're going to kill someone. Do you consider having killed someone? No. Uh, so sometimes you, um, you do things. Uh, you don't uh, necessarily uh, kill uh, directly the person, but uh, you know that, of course, you're not bringing joy in his life, for sure. And it might certainly end up badly uh, for this person. Uh, now, to reply to exa exactly your, your question, it's, it's a question I can't reply in detail. This question around how physically fit um, Jack had to be, to, be, um, to be working the kind of job you did. Well, because I look fat. <laughs> um, no, no, you have, you, you, yeah, you have, you have to. Uh, so you have a lot of um, uh, martial arts uh, training, of course, but it's not like for in movies, you know, do some Jason Bond stuff. It's really to uh, to be able to escape uh, a bad situation, um, and so. Uh, and unfortunately, also, you have to learn how to take uh, punches. So um, they teach you how to uh, basically being beaten up, uh, this kind of stuff. So, you, yeah, you have to be fit because otherwise, if it does happen and you're not fit enough, you can't contain the, the heat. So you have to stay fit. And also because uh, being fit 
uh, allows you uh, to be less tired on missions. And the problems happen when you are tired because you forget something. And that's where uh, big problems happen. So you have to be fit to be sharp. Well, Will Jack's sons be spies? I don't know. Uh, I mean, one of them is uh, clearly saying now that he wants to be a fighter pilot. So um, you can imagine how my wife is happy with that. <laughs> uh, and the other one. Your mother-in-law. Uh, oh, my mother-in-law. <laughs> um, and uh, for, for the other one, uh, I don't know. But look, if I, I just want them to be happy and maybe not to do the, the same mistakes as I did. And so whatever they want to do, uh, as long as they are happy uh, from their choices, uh, it will make me happy. So I, I don't want to force them in, any, in anything. Got time for a couple more questions. I just had one for you, um, selfishly, because I've got the microphone. Um, when you finished the, the book and it was all locked, in, locked down, um, did, you have, did it need to be vetted by your former spy masters or what, what sort of um, oversight if any, did, did, did you give them? Uh, yes, uh, as I was uh, saying at, at, the, at the very beginning, you have um, some people writing books about the services for lots of different reasons. Um, those who are living uh, unhappy with the services because they consider they've been badly treated. Uh, and so it's a kind of revenge. Um, and that's where it's a bit dangerous and reveals secrets you shouldn't reveal. Mm. Uh, some people who uh, want to just uh, do an autobiography about what they did because they want to uh, satisfy their ego. Um, and for those two uh, situations, usually uh, the company is not really happy uh, with those people. And those people can have big problems. But more than that, uh, the spies, I mean, I, I still have a lot of mates who are on the field mm. uh, in the company. And, and writing such a book, you, you put their life at risk mm. and, and, uh, and their family's life at risk. Uh, and so it's clearly not the thing to do. Uh, so it was clearly not the thing I wanted to do. Uh, that's why I wrote uh, a fiction and it's presented as a fiction and as a novel um, because I wanted to address this, you know, father and kids um, part of the, of, of the job. Uh, so I didn't ahead. Uh, I told them that I was writing a book uh, I had to explain roughly what it would be. Uh, and for the moment so far, everything is, is fine. And actually, they even consider that it's going to be a good uh, advertising for the company, like, like, the, like the TV series, The Bureau, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, and it was a lonely job in many ways, um, as you've talked about earlier. Um, the friends that you made in the intelligence um, world um, have you still got some close friends? Yeah, yeah, very. Uh, it's more than friends. It's it's uh, brothers. brothers. The problem is, um, when you join the company, you have your brothers in arms of the uh, fighter jets of the air force, um, and and the company asks you to cut the links with those guys. So you lose. Uh, you you, st you stop replying to their you know messages or your, their phone calls and everything because you have to reduce your your first uh, circle, you know, um, and uh, you lose a lot of brothers of the normal military. And then when you join the intelligence, uh, you can't tell anyone, you can't talk to anyone. So the only one who you can talk to or share what you're doing is the other guys doing the same as you do. Uh, because you, you have some uh, uh, psychiatrist or psychoanalyst, uh, you can, you are supposedly, uh, you, you can, apparently go and see but you know that if you do if you do so and if you go and see them and talk to them immediately you're going to be withdrawn from the field and because they will consider that if you go and see the doctor it means you have a problem so you're weak and if you're weak you're going to die and so you mustn't go on the field anymore so they say to you that it's to help you but actually it's the if you do so it's the end of it so the only way you can do it is basically go and get pissed with your your, your mates doing the same Look, it's been a fascinating conversation. I know there are some more questions. Um, Jack Beaumont will be signing books and I think I'll be out there as well with my books too afterwards and we're more than happy to take a couple more questions there. But um, thank you for an in incredible conversation um, and also for writing such a, a wonderful book and, and good, good luck with the rest. And um, Thanks, Tim. Yeah, and thanks yeah, to thank, everyone. Thanks, all of you. Thank you.